And now it's time for the real estate debate. Let's meet today's guests. Melissa, Sophia, Lisa, Ruiz, Noir, Hermes, and Eric Townsend. All right, folks, let's get to the debate. All right, welcome to the Real Estate Debate. Thank you all for being here so much. It's great to have every single one of you. This is the best real estate discussion in all of San Diego. Uh, so first of all, make sure you agree or disagree, or I'll have to press you. Uh, topic number one, home buyers in this market need to write offers on multiple properties and learn not to fall in love with just one home at a time. Lisa Louise. Absolutely, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree fully, and I tell my clients this all the time. If and it depends mm -hmm. on the market that you're in. If you're in a, a competitive market that is like the 450 to 550 price range in East County, then um, you're going to have to write a couple offers at a time just to make sure that you're casting a big enough net. Otherwise, it could just drag on and on and on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and on mm -hmm. and, and, on, on, and yeah. on and on and on and <laughs> on. Melissa, what do you think? I agree <clears throat> with an asterisk. Okay. Uh, you know, my asterisk being wh when my clients are writing offers, I always let them know that their offers have to be written in the sense of good faith and fair dealing so that they are actually willing to complete all the transactions that they go out and make offers on. Uh, so do I encourage my clients to just run around town writing all kinds of offers, seeing which one sticks? Not necessarily. Uh, I feel like that strategy might end them up in a home that's not necessarily mm. perfect for them. And I don't want them to think, oh, God. Remember that realtor? This house is okay, but you know, it was the only one on the market. Um, I really want to encourage them to find the right home for them. So I'll do things like ask deeper questions of the listing agent, find out some more information, talk to neighbors, really go the extra mile to help them figure out if a home is right for them. And if that you know, will write offers on every home that they find is, is a good home for them. And if that means we have multiple offers out on properties, then I just make sure that the listing agent knows as soon as possible when my clients decide to uh, have a change of heart. So, you know, their, their needs come first and uh, quality versus quantity. I know what you mean by throwing mud against the wall. Right. Um, but also there's the fact that, you know, you can, there's nothing against, you know, there's nothing illegal, there's nothing wrong necessarily from a paperwork standpoint, you know, for going out and writing multiple offers, sure. not necessarily coming through, right? So I like the fact, I, I like where your ethics are. I do, I like it. <laughs> Eric, how about you? I think it's fine when I'm working with a client and I start with a client, I try to really give them a good perspective on uh, what types of properties and what type of offers they need to make on different types of properties. Uh, it all comes down to marketing. It comes down to the way the property is presented. If you have a really nice property with a really good price, really beautiful pictures, you just have to let your clients know you're going to be competing for this property. If it's a really, you know, terrible pictures, price really high, it's a property that's probably not going to be leaving the market for a while, there's opportunities there. And that's where you can make opportunities on properties. So when it comes from a standpoint of writing multiple offers, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with clients doing that. I like to caveat that as well as Melissa with, you know, obviously I want to put terms into the contract that, that make it clear that the buyer is making multiple offers, if that's the scenario. Uh, but typically what I found with clients is if they understand that dynamic, if they understand the, the different uh, strengths of the marketing pieces that the listing agents are putting out on the market, if it's really strong, they got to go in really strong. And if it's weak, let's, you know, take as much, much advantage of the situation as we can. Yeah, I guess you uh, you don't have to write <clears throat> multiple offers or offers on multiple properties um, if you're willing to just make a huge offer. Sometimes you have to. That's uh, that's, have that's one way to combat the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but in those scenarios where you have a beautiful house, but there were just really bad pictures taken, you know, you look at the market, you look at people who market properties, and you, about five percent of the agents in San Diego do about fifty percent of the listings. That other 50% of the listings are done by people that aren't sharp. They don't know really their market that well. They're not sharp in the market with what's going on. Those are, you know, opportunities. And they use bad pictures. They list the property too high because they don't understand how to explain to a seller, hey, this is a marketing tool as well. Where you list it at isn't where you're going to close at. They don't understand how to explain those different dynamics in, the, in the, their marketing pieces. 
And when that happens, it gives you an opportunity to go in and, you know, obviously if it's a great property, great pictures, a lot of competition, you go to the open house, there's 100 people there, watch out. <laughs> it's going to be tough. But if you walk into a house and there's no open house and you go there for a private showing and there's tenants in there and it's impossible to get in, then you've probably got an opportunity. Interesting. So bad pictures might be where the opportunity is. <laughs> Usually. I tell clients all the time, I say, look for bad pictures. <laughs> you like the house, and you like the way it looks, but it's got terrible pictures. Other buyers that are looking at it in the market probably don't like it either. So. Yeah, they just skip right over it because it's so easy to look. Now you don't have to invest any time. You're just online. and oh, skip the next one. You know? Yeah, so, exactly. Good point. Yeah. Noir, what do you think? Agree or disagree? Home buyers in this market need to write offers on multiple properties and learn not to fall in love with just one home at a time. <laughs> um, both, actually. I agree and I disagree uh, in many aspects. I think that it's, uh, it's a learning curve on the client and how... Like, when, you, when you're with a client, and I think it's a learning experience, so you get to deal with them, uh, showing them properties uh, that are fresh, you know, first five days or first uh, week on the market, you're going to inform them, listen, it's going to be crazy. So just, just look at it, check it out, see what it is. You show them other properties, and they'll like that one, and they'll like that one. Usually, like with real estate agents, when working on the client, a, a new client, they usually fall in love with the first home. Oh, that was the first one. They always go back to that first. Well, that first house was like this, or it was like that. So when presenting offers uh, on a new listed property, uh, I kind of wait a little bit. Hmm. Uh, and I kind of do like in a tactic, because it works sometimes. Uh, a lot of times, is, uh, I'll definitely be in contact with the agent. I'm like, okay, listen, you know, the, we saw this property. We loved your listing. Clients, you know, the really you know, into this property, and uh, you get the vibe of the listing agent. Okay, what's going on, where are they at? Talk to them about my client. Okay, we're in either VA or we're going in FHA, or we're going in financial, and you kind of like scope out to see what kind of insight you can get from them. So if you're talking to a listing agent, they're like, you know, uh, yeah, we had two other offers that came in already. Um, we're gonna be meeting with the seller tomorrow. One of them is an FHA buyer. Um, you know, we're kind of in a gray area how much we can expose um, to keep it all ethical and keep it all, you know, fair to everybody. But sometimes when you know someone's coming in with 50% down at full price, I'm just going to tell you, listen, dude, your you're 5% conversion, it's just not going to happen. It's just not, it's just not worth it. But um, we keep it, I, I keep it on the back burner all the time. So you're saying basically uh, that each situation is different. <coughs> every situation is different. And so you can't just say, all right, well, for everybody, you should be out running around making multiple offers. And I think that's, that's definitely true. You know, this, situationally speaking, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not encouraging everyone out there who's a home buyer to go and start writing offers on every single <laughs> property in the neighborhood that you like. You know, that, that's obviously, you know, absurd. Um, but I think what happens a lot of times is the, the heartbreak. In the heartbreak of the home buyer who's like, oh, we found the perfect house. They get so excited. They start picturing things. And then and they make a good offer even. Right. Mm -hmm. And they still don't get it mm -hmm. because the 50% down guy. Right. That happens, and that heartbreak is there. So I think more importantly than just being you know, willing to write offers on multiple properties is just reminding yourself that if you fall in love with a property, it could be dangerous. When you have clients that aren't able to, that aren't successful in making the right offer on a property, the highest offer, and they go into it, as long as you've advised them correctly and as long as you've explained to them the situation with the property and that this is gonna to be tough, there's gonna to be competition on the property, it's gonna be hard and they understand that. Once that's done, if they're not successful on it, they'll usually continue going forward because at least they knew that it was gonna to be tough. Mm -hmm. It's the client that is surprised. It's when all they don't about get preparing the them, exactly. Yeah. It's all about it. Yeah. So they're not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then the choice is theirs. Yeah. yeah. That's well, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Preparation. Watch this show, you get a lot yeah. of preparation. You gotta yeah. prepare sure. them and have a good offer. Yeah, good offers. All about writing good offers. Crucial in, the, in communication. And being a good agent. negotiator, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, headed to topic number two. Home sellers mm -hmm. who also want to buy are better off renting until this market cools down a little, not just because of prices, but because of how hard it is to coordinate the simultaneous transactions. Noir? Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, in, in, a, in a point where right now the rental market is just ridiculously fire. Um, something will go on Craigslist or we'll list it or I, I'll put an ad on my Facebook. Um, it'll be rented within several hours. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Sometimes, uh, and this happened recently actually, I had a property in El Cajon off of uh, in Granite Hills area. Um, I just put it on my Facebook. I don't even use you know, Craigslist or anything like that. And I said, we're gonna have an open house, 
for viewing from one to three, I had 10 applications. I, I couldn't keep up, I, I didn't know what to do. I really don't know what to do. I just told the guy, look, they're all great, pick one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some actually, the person that actually took it, they brought deposit, first month's uh, rent, right on the spot. Like, here you go, this, we need a spot. Yeah, and people don't do that just naturally. That's after a couple of them have fallen through. Mm -hmm. They start bringing the checkbook with them. Yeah. They're just yeah, they're just they're <laughs> just at a point where they need to be aggressive. It's all about you know the whole aggression. But uh, going back to the you know the question uh, in regards to the sellers, um, sometimes uh, it depends on, on on where the seller is doing what they're doing. Uh, if they're selling the property to upsize or to downsize or to relocate, uh, I mean. It, it, all, it all depends. So I think a lot of sellers right now actually want to cash in on the market. I think they kind of see, you know, that the market's high. Absolutely. Uh, surprisingly high in some cases. And they go, well, all right, we've seen this yeah. before. Uh, last time we wish we had sold. Right. <laughs> the tenured sellers. So <laughs> how do yeah. we take advantage this time? Because if we want to sell, but then we just buy in the same market, we didn't really get anything. I think that's where it's coming from. And yeah, the, all they're doing is recycling their money. If not, they're actually getting less for what they have. Um, they're going to pay more higher in property mm -hmm. taxes. It's probably a smaller house um, for the bank that they have the equity in. Right. Um, unless they're they're downsizing or they're relocating. For example, the downtown, or, or they're you know instead of moving, you know their kids went to college. They don't want this five bedroom house anymore. They'd rather go, you know, get a two bedroom condo in Little Italy, and they have several hundred thousand dollars in equity after they bought. Why not? Um, okay, makes sense. Eric, what do you think about sellers who are? You know, considering not putting off the buy side of their deal to rent. I think it's a bad idea. I think that the dual escrows, I think it's very possible to do it. Again, it comes down to the market, what the market's doing. You know, you can always find a client a property. You can get them into a property. I think that the risk here is even if everything that we have right now economically with our market in San Diego is based on fundamentals. We don't have crazy loans. We don't have adjustable rate mortgages. We don't have negative amortization mortgages. We have a market that's based on fundamentally sound loans, and it's also a market where incre uh, incomes are increasing about 3% a year. So we know increases that come from wages are gonna directly relate to how much they're able to afford. And right now, from everything that I hear from the, the real players in the market, uh, you know, the National Association of Realtors, all the different people that are discussing the market, we have a bubble, but it's on the buyer side we have a lack of supply. Mm -hmm. There's no question that buyers still want to get in the market and they're willing to pay for it. They're willing to pay top dollar for it, and that's going to continue until we run into a situation where there's less, where there's more supply, and we're just not there. So I think getting out of the market and losing, you know, if you have a, a $900,000 house and it's going to gain 3% per year, that's $27,000 a year you're losing on that property. And to take that money out and go into the rental market where you don't get the tax breaks, you don't get those benefits. Uh, you're basically putting your money into somebody else's pocket. That's all where you could be paying down your own principal for your own property, and you could also be accumulating the, the gains in that property. Okay. And I don't think anybody really right now thinks that the market is necessarily in a, in a bad position. Yeah, it's, it's definitely high. It's gone to a high point, but fundamentally, it's still, still sound. Melissa, what do you think? I disagree. I, you know... Out of 13 homes I have in escrow, probably five of them are contingent upon uh, the sale of another property. And you say you have 13 homes in escrow right now? I do. You go, girl. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> so, yeah, and I'm you still take here. Somebody to she's here. Yeah, she's yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you take somebody to lunch after <laughs> <laughs> All right, lunch is <laughs> on uh, So, you know, many of those homes are contingent upon mm -hmm. the sale of another property. I, I am definitely not an agent that's afraid to do multiple uh, transactions simultaneously. I think that there are so many sellers out there that have been waiting years to recoup the home values. Uh, some of them bought high and are just now seeing the opportunity to make moves that they've been waiting to make for a long time. So I think it's important to support our clients regardless of how difficult a transaction may be. Uh, do I have clients out there who like to only sell high and buy low? Yeah, I do. And those are the people that are going to be renting, even though the rental market is probably just as crazy as our <laughs> seller's market right yeah. now. Um, but, you know, I think the most important thing is to keep my clients up to date and current. Things like Brexit and making the interest rate drop, uh, just keeping my clients informed on that and they can make their decision upon what is, is best for them. Okay, Lisa. 
I want to know what you think about simultaneous transactions. And this stuff <laughs> I love thing. simultaneous transactions. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm pretty adamant about clients. Unless you have a really good reason to not buy something right away, you absolutely need to sell your house, buy another one, do it simultaneously. I have had clients insist on doing it the other way, and they've lost out. They've sold their house. We're just gonna we're gonna wait and we're gonna rent and we're gonna we're gonna wait till we find the perfect house or we're gonna wait until the prices drop and then the prices never drop and then they spent all their money and then they thought it was gonna be a better outcome and then they're upset because they're renters now and they've spent all their money and they can't buy another house and if you're talking about like the the average person it's what's best for them do they want to be a homeowner probably like you know it's the American dream they probably want to be a homeowner they want to have the tax write off and renting doesn't give you either of those and it, just over long term like Eric said over long term it's definitely what's best for that client and I'm talking about like the average family not the person that's you know buying rental properties or has a whole bunch of, of no, yeah, extra things we're talking about people who <clears throat> want to buy we w want this to we're own. talking about people who want to own a home right so if you want to own a home and you want to be that homeowner and you eventually want to pay your home off and probably have that financial freedom then mm -hmm. renting is not part of that so, and 100% you have to have a realtor that knows how to do that right. because it's mm. tricky and it's, mm -hmm. it, it can turn into mm. a disaster sometimes. <laughs> what so. I will tell you is this, uh, and I will close it with this, and I appreciate everyone's comments. This has been awesome. Thank you all so much for coming. What I'll tell you is this, going from being a homeowner to a renter in this market is like the Bermuda Triangle. Right. Yes. Like, you, you, when do you jump back in? It's like double dutch, you know? <laughs> right. Seriously. It's like, so true. How do you... When do you know? What if you know that house is twenty five thousand more, uh, and do you now have to wait? Right. You know, or do you have to like pay up? And then they question themselves. You question everything. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think you know sideways moves in up markets uh, are okay. You know, especially if you're cashing out yes. on on the front end of it. Um, but everyone's situation is unique, and that's why we've been great professionals on the real estate debate. Thank you guys so much for coming on thank today. You. Really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back again next month, same time, same channel. We will see you then.